Whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be, this is Omar Serrano with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast. I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. I want to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney and it's after hours. So have a seat. Feel free to have a drink and join me. Let's get started. Good morning, everybody. This is Omar Serrato with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast, joined by Ileana Clon Rosa. Um, for the first time in a couple of weeks. I know. It's been a couple of weeks. And every now and then, Ileana has to take her own mental health breaks. <laughs> and we didn't do a show last Friday, you know? No. I had to take my own mental health. It's like, you know what? I'm not doing it today. And I didn't. Um, but there's been a lot that's happened since this mm-hmm. Karen retrial, obviously mistrial and all last time that we did a show we were discussing this case in our opinion was oh there's no way they're gonna end. look they're gonna go come back after the weekend they're mm-hmm. gonna figure some things out they're going to come back refreshed but god damn it they it's like a couple hours later um it turns out that if you believe the affidavits of the defense attorneys where they say that jurors had reached out to them and said that they were unanimous on not guilty on second degree murder they were mm-hmm. unanimous Um, I think on count two, not guilty, they were stuck on count three, um, which is an odd ruling. But there was, look, there's been, there was a lot of lead up um, and speculation leading up to the jury forms, the jury Mm -hmm. slips. There was this note um, that was respectfully written saying that, look, uh, we are deeply divided in our respective positions. And if we were to give in, it would cause either side to violate their moral conundrums. And then judge, well, I'm not going to make you do that. I declare a mistrial. And that's where we went. Um, a lot has been made about, well, she didn't even poll the jury. Like she could have, she 100% could have and perhaps should have polled the jury. But in Massachusetts, it's not required that they do. There's a lot of misinformation out there um, stating that she was supposed to pull, pull the jury. That's not the law in Massachusetts. I did my own independent research. There's case law that says that specifically the judge doesn't have to do that. Um, The question is, if what the defense is saying is true in that they were sold on acquittal on the, the, the major charges, then what right does the defense have to retry the case without violating constitutional principles of double jeopardy? So there's that. Um, You know, I should be rolling the intro right now. I normally do like my big teaser, (laughs) but I just did the intro right off the bat. So here we are. Um, What was your opinion, Ileana, when you heard hung jury on that fateful day a couple of weeks ago, whenever it was? Um, I was a little bit surprised. Uh, I was a little bit, I guess, happy. (laughs) I don't know why. I I felt that uh, her attorneys did a good job. but. Then when I started reading about pulling the jury and all that, I was like, oh, like, I don't know. Um, The legal aspects of this case. Here's what it is. If it's true that the jurors were going to acquit on the major charges in the case and you have the Commonwealth stating that they want to retry the case, does double jeopardy apply? If you can prove that the jurors were really um, 100% going to acquit her on those charges. The answer is, yeah, well, yeah, no, because then double jeopardy would attach. It's just the legal process. The question is, how are you going to go about the process of proving that mm-hmm. without polling the jury individually, which I don't believe that you're allowed to do? That's a good question. So a lot of this depends on, okay, that's great if that's true, but how do I prove it? Because in that note, it didn't sound like they were in accord. Just that note. And we're going to listen to the video leading up to the mistrial again, saying that, look, some of us are deeply ingrained in the fact that the Commonwealth has proven their case. Others believe that they have not. That was the language. It was very yes. vague and ambiguous. Um, and then you have these jurors reaching out and saying, well, no, actually, we were not really all that divided. We were in agreement on some charges, just not others, not the lesser included. And then you had one other juror a couple of days later on July 10th. Um, come forward and say something similar. Yes. And then Alan Jackson was like, see, there is some truth to that statement. We don't know about the rest. Yeah, but there's 10 other jurors in there. 
And um, we don't know for a fact that all of them would share that opinion. Who was the one defector or multiple defectors? I had speculated that the fact that they use the word some mm -hmm. literally could mean one. There's one holdout. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to be kind and to protect his or her identity and say some. Um, and I thought that there was maybe just one person that was just really didn't like Karen Reed because I don't know, didn't like her voice, didn't like the way that she presented in court. Maybe he had a, a bad uh, relationship with somebody that looked like her and um, decided that no matter what she did, she was guilty. Um, but the evidence didn't support an angry 12 angry men. Um, he was going to uh, turn the entire jury against her. Beach Lover says, uh, what did she say? I think that Reed attorney hands video was deemed AI. Oh, was it AI? I don't know. I have no idea if it was AI or not. It was just dropped on our Discord, um, which is, you know, AI is a scary thing. I don't know what's real anymore, man. I don't know if voices. Well, remember when we try to do our AI voices? I try to generate mine. Yeah, that's clearly a robot. Okay, but I don't have the best software. But there's clearly um, software out there where you could just make new Elvis Presley songs. Matter of fact, matter of fact, uh, I know I'm going off script here. Uh, Elvis Presley AI song. Check this out. Um. Oh, yeah, that was this one. Tell me this doesn't sound exactly like Elvis. All right. I wouldn't know the difference. You told me that was a, now he's talking about Big Butts. He's, mm -hmm. It's the 1990 whatever song. I don't know if you caught that or not. But um, that sounds, that sounded good. I would, I, I would, I would get down to that song, man. That was, it sounded good, man. If, if you, if you were uh, wanting to emulate Elvis Presley, mm -hmm. totally do it. My AA is definitely scary. My husband and stepson went to the Sphere in Las Vegas. Oh, and they haven't been have there some yet. robots uh, with AI, and you can talk to them and create conversations. And they said that it was extremely scary <laughs> how much they can interact with humans and how much alike they are to a human being. It's I've seen that robot. Yeah. And like how they start, they start saying uh, crazy stuff like, um, so are you guys ever going to rise up and take over humanity? And then the guy's like, why would we do that? You guys are yes, our friends. Exactly. Of course, we're not going to do anything like that. Yes. You know, secretly plotting. Yes. Yeah, some, apparently somebody that was there asked something similar to that. And it, the robot just responded. It's, it's like, okay, no. <laughs> All right. So let's listen to the actual yes, please. moment. When uh, actually had it here in my notes, when the jury, um, well, the judge declared a mistrial. I'm gonna. I have some thoughts about this judge. Mm -hmm. I didn't like her. I would not oh. like practicing in front of her. Me and her would get in a lot of arguments. <laughs> I suspect. Um, well, let's just play the video before I, I say something. Um, that link. Here we go. Before I do that, let me just make sure that everybody could. Hear the audio here. Hey, chat, let me know if you can hear the audio on this video. All right, Mr. Foreman, I am in receipt of your note. Are they not hearing the audio? I can hear it on my end, so it should pick up for them. Yeah, they can hear. Okay. All right, let me, uh, let's resume. Judge Canoni, despite our rigorous efforts, we continue to find ourselves at an impasse. Our perspectives on the evidence are starkly divided. Some members of the jury firmly believe that the evidence surpasses the burden of proof, establishing the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Here's my problem with Alan Jackson's declaration. Listen to what she just said and tell me if that sounds like a jury that was all in favor of acquittal on all of the counts except for count three. Establishing the 
the burden of proof, establishing the the jury firmly believe that the evidence surpasses the burden of proof, okay. establishing the elements of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt. Conversely, others find the evidence fails to meet this standard and does not sufficiently establish the necessary elements of the charges. The deep division is not due to a lack of effort or diligence, but rather a sincere adherence to our individual principles and moral convictions. To continue to deliberate would be futile and only serve to force us to compromise these deeply held beliefs. I'm not going to do that to you folks. Your service is complete. I'm declaring a mistrial in this case. I'll be in to see you privately in a few minutes. So thank you so much for your service. Does she remind you of any judge in a courtroom that you work at that used to practice or around here yeah. until about a couple of years ago? You know who I'm talking about? She had like this kind of look and almost those exact mannerisms and that same speech yes. pattern. It's not the same judge, but she was mean like that. Yes. Our yes. judge is a lot meaner than her. I'm yes. just saying she reminds me of her. Okay. If I, I'm thinking of one, I don't know if the same. You don't have to name it, but if you're thinking yeah. about it, I, chances are we're, yes. you're, it's the one. Not that I didn't like that judge, but she mm -hmm. scared me to death. Mm -hmm. She was like one of my first judges that I've ever practiced. And of course it would be her and she would just rip me a new one whenever she felt like it, yeah. honestly. Um, so, all right. The problem with this whole thing, these motions is all it takes is one juror to say, no, we were not yep. all in favor of acquittal. And then the entire motion is moot at that point. Mm -hmm. And then, and really the, the standard is, is really that low. All it just takes is one. And then the, the, the people of the Commonwealth are going to be able to retry the case. Let's finish this. Okay. All right. So the court, please. All right. We don't need to uh, examine that further. So that was the motion. Mm -hmm. That was the motion. Um, I heard Emily D. Baker um, give some thoughts that the juror should have been, the jury should have been polled. Um, and maybe they should have, but it's not required Yeah, if it's not required in Massachusetts to do that. Um, it would have been a really good thing to do. Yes. It would have been really smart to have done that. It would have saved some time for everybody. Yeah. But the fact that she didn't do that, does that auto automatically, um, invoke double jeopardy? No, I don't think so. here's the law just so that we're all clear. All right. And I'm not just talking out of my ass. Um, in Massachusetts, the procedure for declaring a mistrial in a criminal case where a jury trial was had involves several key considerations and steps. A mistrial may be declared when there is a manifest necessity for the act or when the ends of public justice would otherwise be defeated. This means that the trial judge must determine that continuing the trial would not would not result in a fair and just outcome. That comes from Elder v. Commonwealth, 385 Mass, 128. The trial judge has the discretion to declare a mistrial. The discretion, the discretion. Um, and this decision is typically made after considering various alternatives. For example, in some cases, the judge may consider curative instructions, in which case the judge did give curative instructions. Um, I don't know if they were the best instructions, but she gave instructions um, to the jury or a voir dire to assess potential prejudice before deciding to declare a mistrial. That comes from Levitt v. Commonwealth, 393 Mass 444, and Commonwealth v. Bryan, 476 Mass 351. Uh, the judge must balance the defendant's right to have their trial completed by a particular tribunal against the public's interest, interest in fair trials designed to end in just judgments. Elder v. Commonwealth. And you got to understand, too, that this law, this law literally dates back to the 1500s mm -hmm. when they were doing uh, the same in witch trials. It's literally almost basically the same jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So this is case law that's been developed longer than America has been a country, the United States. Um, that was Elder v. Commonwealth 385, the same case. So if they, if, if a mistrial, now notice in those cases, and I'm not reading the cases because it would take... I mean, honestly, this is like a weak seminar, um, but none of that language directs a judge as a requirement to poll a jury. 
He gave them limiting instructions or further instructions. They did that. And so here we are. So if a mistrial is declared due to a deadlocked jury, this is considered a manifest necessity. It was a declaration of a um, deadlocked jury. And double jeopardy principles do not bar a retrial. That's from Fuentes versus Commonwealth 448 Mass 1017 and Ray versus Commonwealth 463 Mass one. However, if a mistrial is declared over the defendant's objection, this part is important because the defense was not given an opportunity exactly. to object. So this is why this is going to probably going to the Supreme Court. Um, because just because this is the law does not mean um, that it's necessarily covers all constitutional bases. Then the question becomes, was the judge required to offer the defense the opportunity to object? Because the alternate argument to that is the judge doesn't have to give legal advice. They could have objected at any time. The fact that they didn't and were silent acted as a waiver of objection to which uh, they didn't make, although them being powerful, experienced attorneys, um, would have known that they had the right to do that and they just didn't object. They just let me continue with the mistrial. And sometimes that happens in family law. I know, look, it's not maybe 50% of the times the objections that I make, the judge doesn't ask me for my objection. I just make no. it. Yeah. And it's a fair point to make if you're on the Commonwealth side and say, no, they had the opportunity to object. They just didn't. They knew, they saw where this was going. <laughs> and plus they could, they could also maybe argue that they already objected um, the first time which resulted in further instructions from the judge and the like. Now I know I'm playing, I know most of the people listening to this stream that watch this video are going to be wanting um, or in favor of the defense. Um, we have some super chats. Uh, let me, before I, before I get too far into this. Um, oops. Uh, sarcasm. Why didn't the jury ask how to complete the form? If that was the case, I'm not so sure that the form was all that big of an issue because I think that the original forms that I saw were modified yes. to more aptly fit what the defense was asking. And I'll go over that video because that's, that's a great point um, that I wanted to discuss because that is highly relevant uh, to, because, I mean, it all led up to this, to this mistrial. Um, hey, Brad is in the house. What's up, Brad? IT goatee. Um, he's a, IT goatee is like a, my IT guy when Dominic's not around. Okay. Not officially, just <laughs> he's the guy that I go to. Um, he's done a couple live streams with me. He's a he's got his own YouTube channel. Um, he's the best. Because <clears throat> I got whiskey on my face. Okay, so before where was I at? I was we reading. Uh, the, I was reading stuff. Yes, um, about the forms. All right. So if they they talk about what is considered manifest destiny, that's basically when the jury says that we're deadlocked. Um, I'm going to talk. So, however, if a mistrial is declared over defendant's objections, that's where we're at. The judge must have given defense counsel a full opportunity to be heard and must have considered all reasonable alternatives before making the decision. And that is where yeah. the argument lies, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, yes. Was he given full opportunity? What does full opportunity even mean? Because if I was the judge and I was trying to cover my ass, but look, this this defense attorney objected over 10,000 times mm -hmm. in the course of two months. He's well aware of the rules and how to make objections. He's been, um, he, he represented Karen Reed extraordinarily well. He's well-versed in the law. He knew what was available to him. The fact that he didn't object when I was declaring a mistrial, I should not have to ask him directly if he if he wished because I don't even think she asked the people at that point. She just declared no, it. No, no. But at the same time, when you're reading the law, it's saying that she must give the opportunity or the judge must, must give the opportunity to the defense. Right. It's not talking about objection. So, so if you recall, was she the one that needed to do that uh, that question? Yeah, and and so, but she did mm -hmm. not. When in that video, mm -hmm. but prior, I think on Friday, oh, okay. okay. Um, she asked the, the Commonwealth, What do you guys think about you know declaring Mr. Brown now? And they had argument, and then okay. the defense was heard at that time, mm -hmm. and then they broke for the weekend, came back, deliberated for like an hour, and then declared mistrial. So the question then becomes, Was that enough? Yeah, mm -hmm. 
if I was the defense, I'm saying, no, it's not enough. I should have been heard. I wanted to take, I would have, I'm assuming that Mr. Jackson would have requested a poll of the jurors to see where they're at. What is the hangup? I need more information. Um, which would have been fair, a fair request. And I think that had that objection been made, I don't think that the judge would have said, no, I'm not polling anybody. I'm just done. Cause that would have been ridiculous. Mm -hmm. All right. We've been doing this for a couple of months. What's it, you know, all right. So where are we at on count one? Um, give me the, give me the numbers. Yes. Um, what's, what's wild to me is that I'm hearing, I've heard other law tubers out there suggest that they know what the polls were, what the numbers were. Oh. Some were suggesting it was like 10 to two. Some were suggesting it was eight to four. I don't know where they got that from. I know. <laughs> but now you have Jackson saying, no, it was 12. Oh, in favor of acquittal on, on the major counts. I don't know what to believe. And my only point is if there's one juror that comes forward and says that that affidavit is bullshit <laughs> motion defeated. It's that simple. It really is. Um, let me continue with this. So in summary, the procedure for declaring a mistrial in Massachusetts involves the judge's careful consideration of whether continuing the trial would be unjust, the exploration of alternatives to a mistrial, and ensuring that the decision is made in the interest of both the defendant and the public justice. This process is guided by the principle of manifest necessity, which is an ancient legal term, um, and the need to ensure fair trials. And again, they cite to Elder v. Commonwealth, Ray v. Commonwealth. Um, if you're wondering where I'm reading this from, it's uh, literally from Lexis, <laughs> my own independent research. I figure that I pay for Lexis. I might as well use yes. it for something <laughs> useful. So it's not cheap. <laughs> yeah. Here's a question. If is it required that the judge poll the jury prior to declaring a mistrial? Is it required? No, it is not required that the judge poll the jury prior to declaring a mistrial in a criminal case. In Massachusetts, the decision to poll the jury is within the discretion of the trial judge, and you should put those in bold underlying letters. Discretion means basically if you're going to get one over on appeal, it's going to be because of an abuse of discretion, which is really hard to prove. Um, and there's a case in Commonwealth v. Nettis, 418 Mass 715, the court upheld the trial judge's decision to poll the jury after a juror indicated dissent. Leading to the declaration of a mistrial, the judge acted within his discretion in setting aside the improperly recorded verdict because the jury had not agreed unanimously. Um, also in that case, um, similarly, in Commonwealth v. Reeves, 434 Mass 383, the court noted that a judge's handling of the jury poll does not necessarily affect the validity of the original verdict if the verdict had already been recorded which is not helpful because I don't know if their, no. their verdict was recorded in an official way. Um, but furthermore, also in this other case, Commonwealth v. Commonwealth v. Herbert, 379 Mass 752, the court found that a mistrial should have been declared when a juror did not agree with the verdict, but the judge's failure to poll the jury before declaring a mistrial was not deemed an error. This indicates that the polling the jury is not a mandatory step before declaring, before declaring a mistrial. So in sum, there was no fast rule that requires a judge to poll anybody. It's just been ruled in other cases that the judge's failure to poll the jury was not deemed error by appellate courts in Massachusetts. That's all. Yes. And that's all you really need to, to, to come to the conclusion that it's not a requirement. Um, furthermore, um, in, so while polling but while polling the jury can be an important step in ensuring the unanimity of a verdict, it is not a required procedure before declaring a mistrial in Massachusetts. This decision rests with the trial judge's discretion based on the circumstances of the case. And again, they're referring to the Nettis case, the Reeves case, the Herbert case, and, and so on. All right. So then let me ask you this. If the jury, after a mistrial has been declared, makes contact with the defense attorney, mm -hmm to indicate that they were unanimous in favor of acquittal on the major charges, but hung on lesser included charges, does it trigger a defendant's protection against double jeopardy? That's the appellate question, mm -hmm. isn't it? And wouldn't you know it, the law is not firmly decided one way or the other, but this is what the law says. The double jeopardy clause generally prevents 
a defendant from being tried more than once for the same offense. However, there are exceptions to this rule, particularly when a mistrial is declared due to a hung jury. In such cases, retrial is typically permitted as long as the evidence presented in the first trial was legally sufficient to support a conviction. Now we're getting into directed verdict stuff, which how I, I, I've never actually seen a directed verdict, verdict, a direct verdict work in a criminal defense. I've heard of it. I've just never seen it in practice. It literally means that there's no reasonable, viable way that any jury could have possibly come to that conclusion. Bullshit. I'm taking it out of the hands of the jury and declaring uh, my own verdict. It's really what that is, which is such a high standard. I've never seen it happen. Seems like in movies. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I, I can't think what the movie would have been. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of lawyer movies. Um, by the way, on our Patreon, you got to come with us when we're doing our um, movie reviews. Mm -hmm. we do these well we, we don't do them yet but we're going to do um our uh movie reviews and we're just going to watch a movie with our patreon subscribers oh. and share our thoughts uh, yeah. no research needed we're just watching movies and i'm pretty sure a you're not a or oh it's gonna be like um i don't know man like 12 angry men would be a real good one um oh. stuff like a time to kill Samuel L. Jackson, Matthew McConaughey. What about the Lincoln lawyer? Everybody likes McConaughey mm -hmm. and that portrayal of stuff. Um, there's oh, The Verdict, yes. uh, my favorite actor of all time. Um, Paul Newman, 1982. Um, hell, Better Call Saul is always up for, um, anyway, I'm getting off topic. People don't like when I do that. Um, so where was I at? The fact that the jury was unanimous in favor of acquittal on the major charges, but hung on the lesser included charges does not change the applicability of double jeopardy protections. The key, the key consideration is whether the mistrial was declared due to manifest necessity. The judge is going to say, of course it was yes. such as a deadlock jury, which allows for a retrial. And then they quote cases, Commonwealth versus FEM, uh, Daniels versus Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth versus Medina. And you guys could all look those cases up. Um, additionally, the communication from the jury to the defense counsel after the mistrial. You know what? I should just share my screen so people know I'm not making this shit up. <laughs> um, here. All right. Well, that didn't have the desired effect, did it? Okay. Um, Did already get past? Yeah, we already got past that one. All right. So the fact that the jury is unanimous, we, yeah, we got past that one. So additionally, the communication from the jury to the defense counsel after the mistrial does not alter the legal standing of the mistrial or the ability to retry the defendant. The court's decision to declare a mistrial due to a hung jury remains valid and double jeopardy protections do not bar a retrial in this context. So if they can prove um, that it really was 12-0, if that can be proven, I don't know how they're going to do it because the jury literally has no obligation to talk to anybody mm -hmm. ever again about this case. Um, then I guess, you know, double jeopardy can apply. It's not really been a thing. It's no. not really a thing in case law right now in Massachusetts. I don't, there's not, there is not a fact for fact scenario such as what we have with Karen Reed right now to give us any direction. So we're left with these legal principles to decide what to do. And if you were ever wondering and wanting to uh, study law or we had designs on becoming a lawyer and wanted to do this for a living, this is kind of how it works. This is how the law is advanced. Mm -hmm. We come up with new areas of law not previously explored and we seek appellate review. And then these cases, the outcomes of these cases drive what the law is going to be. And this body of law has been probably developing for the last thousand years if we're going back to uh imperial law if we're going back to um oh what what did they call the the law in in the uk this is what that's where american law comes from yes I, I don't know i'm not gonna try to remember my history <laughs> class um but just it's thousands of years old so, all right, what is the threshold for the defendant proving the evidence was legally sufficient to support a conviction in the above scenario? That's an important question um, because it goes to what we've been talking about. So the threshold for determining whether the evidence was legally sufficient to support a conviction when a mistrial due to a hung jury has been declared in Massachusetts is whether after viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution, basically everything that they, if 
assuming mm -hmm. that everything that they said was true yes. and there's not evidence that would defeat it and we're giving it in the light most favorable to the prosecution, can a jury decide that Karen Reed was guilty? Um, any rational trier of fact could have found the essential elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, which you and I don't agree on its merits, but if I were to view this as like, a, let's just assume everything the, the Commonwealth said was true yes. and what the defense said uh, wasn't enough to overcome it. Can a jury found enough? Yeah, but they decide that like at the at the um, pre-trial stage, mm -hmm. preliminary hearing stage, the uh, grand jury stage in the Commonwealth. Yeah. So it's already been decided that yes, um, she would be guilty if all the, that's why we have a trial. So that's already basically done. So this standard is consistently applied to Massachusetts case law, for instance, in Taylor v. Commonwealth. It is stated that the Commonwealth must have presented evidence legally sufficient to support a conviction at the first trial or jeopardy terminates for state law purposes and retrial would violate double jeopardy principles. Um, similarly, in Pena versus Commonwealth and Colazo versus Commonwealth, affirm that double jeopardy principles do not bar a retrial after a mistrial due to a hung jury if the evidence presented was legally sufficient. So it's a really hard, hard. thing for the defense mm -hmm. to overcome, especially when we're already there because the, it's already been mm -hmm. determined that that's a thing. Um, the case uh, Penny versus Commonwealth further clarifies that the evidence must be sufficient for a rational trier fact to find the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt when viewed in the light most. That's all a lot of the same thing. So the threshold is met if the evidence when viewed in light most favorable supports conviction. That's it. That's it. So those are those are the rules that we are um, navigating. Those are the rules. Yes, I'm drinking at 11.30 in the morning. <laughs> it's Friday. Um, I'm supposed to go on vacation. Well, not vacation. I'm supposed to go away for the weekend. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pre-gaming it, I guess. I'm the opposite. I'm trying to fall into rhythm after having a couple of days off. Oh, it's so hard getting back into it. <laughs> By the way, I, th I want you to know that our audience was um, really uh, interested in whether or not I provided sandwiches for you or not. Oh, yes. I forgot to ask you. Which I did. They were in the fridge. They're in the fridge. I had them delivered to my house last <laughs> night, just in case. Thank you. Yeah. And then I was like, uh, hey, Dominic, why am I bringing her sandwiches, man? Like, how come she can't bring sandwiches to me? Should I have her bring donuts or something? Coffee? Oh, I can do that. I'll just be maybe later. Late. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So where was I at in my uh, meanderings? Okay, I wanted to pay particularly close attention to this because not that it really matters much in terms of uh, the veracity of the case, but it's just the judge's, her predisposition was very off-putting. Yes, yes. I don't know if she's more favorable to the Commonwealth or to the defense. I don't know. I just think that she was just generally, this was just her attitude. Mm -hmm. I've been in front of judges like that before. Yes. Um, there's not a lot you could do about it, honestly. I mean, you could fart, fight, uh, fight back and forth with them and argue, and they're the ones holding the gavel. What are you going to do? Uh, you could bring them up on appeal, but you know, do you got clients that want to pay for an appeal? Mm -hmm. And even so, do you? You know, um, I don't know, man. But this is the judge. I just thought it was really interesting this portion of it when the judge was literally like, "I'm too tired, and I'm not going to address this." And then they talk about this, and then she yells at Karen Reed for like smiling. And so I, I've, I've man. I feel like if I was a defense attorney and my client mm -hmm. got yelled at by the judge for, for smiling, I would have something to say. Whether or not I would say it or not, I'm just saying it would piss me off. Yes. Um, you have to keep a level of... I find that once I pass a, a certain threshold, I should just not say anything. Because yes. whatever next comes out of my mouth is not going to help anything. It's going to only serve to um, serve my ego, my <laughs> anger, my need to just say something, get one over like I'm 12. Um, but this that's what emotional intelligence is all about well, knowing someone, that threshold <laughs> knowing yeah, I would agree. when to stop <laughs> some days I have better emotional intelligence than others <laughs> um, but just uh, let's take a listen to this um, for the simple proposition that I thought that the judge, the judge in this case was a dick um, and it sucked not that she didn't, you know what, honestly, she did an okay job during the trial. She, she was did just an okay job. It, it was just her attitude. Yeah. It, it, I mean, to me, she really didn't want to be there. She didn't want to be the judge in this case. I disagree. I thought yeah. that she loved being there. 
Well, I just think that I just I think that she loved being there. I just think that she has a low energy threshold and she got fatigued and yeah. you know what judge have you ever seen not want to be like the center of like a major case like this most judges when you see in these kinds of cases are on their best behavior yes um except for that one judge with the parkland case remember that one where she's yelling at attorneys and yelling at public defenders and um oh, what was that case man when that one attorney brought a motion um and she was yelling at him and it's like you don't know the one comment meant uh one attorney made a statement like uh your honor, if you were pregnant or if you had children, oh, you would yes. disagree. It's like, you don't know if I've ever had children. You don't even know if I'm barren or not. You don't know. And then she's like, told him to go sit in the corner. Remember yes. that one? Most judges are on their best behavior. I think that this, this judge, she liked being there. I just mm -hmm. think that she got really tired along with everybody else. Hangry. I feel like, yeah. if, here, you want to know my honest opinion? If you were a judge. Who get hangry? <laughs> in 20, 30 years, if you were a judge, I feel like this would be you. Oh my, oh no. <laughs> well, they need to keep me, at least when you're a judge, you can keep have you snacks fed. and stuff like that. Yes, <laughs> just have my snacks close by and I'll be happy. But I don't know. I feel, to me, I felt like she didn't want to be there or if she wanted to be there just for the, I guess, the attention or having a public case, she didn't like the facts. She felt like she was wasting her time. I don't know. That's, the I feel like I, I feel that, but I feel like when you're on display like that, you mm -hmm. just go fully into whatever your personality is. Mm -hmm. Whenever I've been in high profile cases, not that I've ever been on like a TV case or not, mm -hmm. but whenever I've had like I've sensed the moment and I know that there's a lot of people watching, I usually turn into like super Omar, like whatever, <laughs> whatever drama, whatever persuasive skills, whatever argument, public mm -hmm. speech skills I have just goes on steroids. Mm -hmm. And I just put on a performance. I pretend like I'm in the movies and I'll give this speech. I've done this in child support cases. And so I just, that's, I just know me. That's usually what happens to me. That's why I guess most people like don't know me when I'm in the courtroom. Yeah. Because that, I don't know, that flame comes when I'm there. Like when I know I need to do my job and outside of the courtroom. I'm for you, like, for sure. Yeah, you're, you're not like, to be yeah. bothered, but in, unless somebody pokes you and then just like, um, all right. And then, and then it's like game on. Yes, exactly. This week in court, I literally said that somebody was properly blitzed. It's like, your honor, I don't need a blood alcohol. We got a video and she was properly blitzed. <laughs> Let's, oh God. Slurring her words. She was at least 0.24. You can't tell me otherwise. Nonsense. But I feel like I was going that because yeah. the other attorney was making ridiculous arguments. Never mind. So let me. Uh, let, all right. Before I get too far off, let's. Uh, yes. This interaction piques my interest. They're arguing about the the jury um, the the jury slip. What was that, Dominic? You got to share your screen so they can hear. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me share my screen. Uh, this one. Okay. Okay, I did not say I'd make it. I said I'd think about it. I said I was tired and I needed to think about it. You said before you were tired and you needed to think about it. I was tired and you needed to think about it. that there needs to be not guilty options for the subordinate charges no. uh, under count two. I said that it made sense to me, but no, I did not change it upon looking at it because the verdict slipped. This verdict slip as submitted to the jury is exactly how it always is in Massachusetts. I ask you a question. I, I, I don't really care how it always is in Massachusetts. I care about whether or not it's appropriate. It's appropriate. It's appropriate. Let me make my argument, if you would have mind, Judge, why yeah. it's not appropriate. For, for a superior charge, they have to decide that she is not guilty. By the way, when you when when he heard an attorney say that, Your Honor, let me make my argument. He knows he's going to get defeated. He's putting on the record. Yes. Of the superior charge. And that is the starting point of whether or not she is guilty or not guilty of any subordinate charge, often called a lesser included. Once they decide that she's not guilty of the superior charge, now there's two, two, two additional charges that they've been instructed. They must decide whether she's guilty or not guilty of. How do they decide that she's not guilty of the first subordinate charge in voluntary manslaughter? Okay. Anything else you want to say, Mr. Jackson? I'd like to answer from the court. How uh, do I hate when that was the most disrespectful response ever. Okay, are you done? Is basically what she was saying. 
That was something that's that. very disrespectful. That would have pissed me off. Something oh, fierce. My. That, that uh, that she's not guilty wow. of involuntary manslaughter on that verdict. That's their decision to make. And how do they make it if they don't have an option to check a box that says not guilty? Don't they think- don't check the box that says guilty, do they? And then when they go to the next cha- the next block, they don't check the block that says guilty. And on the top, you're left with not guilty. I have these loving memories of my favorite family law judge. She's now retired. Mm-hmm. This is exactly her. Yes. This is exactly her persona. Um, I like that judge for a lot of reasons. She taught me a lot by kicking my ass in court or reaming me a new one. I but, think that's usually how it goes. Like the uh, judges or even law school professors that really make your life difficult. You yeah. Up, those are the ones you learn from. Yeah. You, those are the ones you learn from. Those are the ones you end up appreciating at the end. <laughs> I hope that judge is doing well. <laughs> she, she, was, she really was a sweet lady when she wasn't on the bench. Okay. So it's the it's the absence of the check mark that the court determines is the not guilty finding by the jury. Yes, that's what the verdict slip reads. It reads not guilty. If they don't check block two, three, or four, the verdict slip reads not guilty. Okay. That that's is, how it is, Mr. Jackson. Well, and apparently that's how it's going to be because of the court's order. That is not how it should be, and it's over our strong objection. They need to to see that there is a not guilty option for their subordinate charges. If they come back guilty on, for instance, involuntary manslaughter, that's immediately appealable. They didn't have an option on the verdict form to find her not guilty. It's almost like he's right. Is directing a verdict of the subordinate charges. Okay. Doesn't mean he'll I disagree with you. He's right. Ms. Tianetti, you've seen verdict slips exactly like this. Okay. I I actually haven't. (laughs) (laughs) Have you had no lesser included? No, we've always had lesser included, but um, I, I have not seen a verdict slip there where by the way that attorney's been practicing for like over 20 years i think unless i'm mistaken but for the judge to ask oh you've never seen lesser included that's such a condescending comment from the judge the kind that would boil my blood (laughs) okay i disagree with you all right excuse me this is funny ms reed oh yeah all right where i draw the line all right do not talk to my client like that uncalled for um, okay. But they ended up changing the forms after all. They did. So let's take a look at the forms, uh, which I saved right here. So the actual forms that the judge read from, or well, that were used were these ones. Let me share my screen so everybody could see it. Uh, jury slips. Okay. So these are the forms. Um, Karen Reed verdict slipped. On the offense of count one, murder in the second degree, there's literally a box, not guilty or guilty. Now, it is the opinion of the motion that a jury reached out and said that they were all unanimous, not guilty, on count one. The more that I think about this, it made perfect sense at the time, but the more that I think about it, um, I'm just skeptical Mm -hmm. that there's not one juror that's going to come out and say that, no, that wasn't the case because I was the one guilty. Whether or not the evidence supported that or not is a different discussion. We literally ran, last time you were here, 30 days of evidence summarizing it. And we're both of the opinion that there's no effing way that you're going to get to second degree here. How? Why was it even charged with this? That's kind of what we're talking about. I think that what we had settled on was maybe you could prove that she was driving in while intoxicated. We'll go for that. Fine. Sure. Uh, she was properly blitzed. Blitz. <laughs> um, you know, whether she had four drinks or nine or 10 based on the receipts or what... She was, uh, no way that she was, I think they did actually take her blood alcohol and it was something like, um, 0.892 or something at 8 AM, which means it would have been much higher prior. So this was a uh, page one, page two. So verdict slip. All right. So on count, it has a offensive count two manslaughter while operating a motor vehicle, which I guess apparently they were also unanimously not guilty, but it has a box. But it has four boxes, not guilty, guilty of offense as charged, guilty of lesser included involuntary manslaughter, guilty of lesser included motor vehicle homicide. If they were really not guilty on all of that, I don't see how they're hung up on count three, honestly, which I think would have been a very, if it's indeed the case that they were going to quit on counts one and two, I think it would have been fair for the judge to go back and say, okay, well, if you're saying she's not guilty in all of these. And count three is literally 
uh, leaving the scene of, well, I guess it's okay. I can see the points. Maybe she left the scene of an accident. But I believe the counts out there, they apparently were uh, decided it was one and three. The number two was the one that they were. uh, Really? I think so. From what I read. Well, we're going to read the motion. We'll we'll, we'll clarify that. I'm pretty sure. I, I thought it was they were hung on count three. Leaving the scene of an accident, which would have been the one that I could see where, well, maybe um, if they thought that the accident occurred before she left, that's right. what they were hung up on. Maybe. Because I was reading. Because it literally says leaving the scene of an accident resulting in death. I. But you're safe, Ileana, because we're going to read the actual motion where they're going to say exactly what it was. I know. I was reading this at four in the morning, so I don't. <laughs> Why were you up at four in the morning? As my child that decided to wake up at four in the morning to talk and oh. then stay up for about 40 minutes and then go back to sleep. <laughs> that's my, that's my daughter's now we're going through this stage where it's yeah. like, um, we used to have this lock on the doors where it's like for their safety. So yes. they don't fall down the stairs. Yeah. Um, you know, they can't, they couldn't get out of the room, but like, okay, what if they got to go to the bathroom? They're like five and four now, mm-hmm. maybe it's the time, but now it's like at 1am at 2am at 3am, Dad, I went potty in my diaper. It's like, why did you go potty in your diaper? The bathroom was right there. Dad, the stars turned off their little nightlight. Yes. Um, after 3 a.m., I stopped responding, apparently. And so, like, I'll respond at 1, 2 when I'm mm-hmm. barely going into sleep. But at 3, I was just dead. And then my wife takes over. And so, <laughs> At least you have a, somebody, well, a teammate. Yeah, a teammate there. With I mean, yesterday was just both of us were woken up at 4 a.m. and we're just like looking at each other and she's just happy <laughs> sitting there like hey let's play i'm like no so i started reading why don't you go play by yourself <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> all right um so we're gonna get to the bottom of what count that we're officially hung, hung up on according to the motion um let me get back to here um y2k survivor says i believe a fourth came forward it was a and if, yeah on the 10th there was a filing mm-hmm. and we're, I'm going to get to that Y2K. I promise. Um, it goatee says, uh, they have three affidavits. Yeah. I'm going to get to all of them. I'm not, I don't want to read the entire motion. Cause that's, you know, I'm sure people have read it. Um, I don't think I need to have this screen open. Do I? Okay. Um, let me get to my next thing. I did the research thing. So here was the formal mission mission motion to dismiss. Uh, and the copy that I have is the official conformed copy that was actually filed by the court. Not the cleaned up version that you can see on other websites. Cause I just don't want to risk it being altered in any kind of a way. Um, look at me being responsible. Uh, okay. Let me, how do I, sh- how do I share this though? Okay. So this was the motion that was filed. Is there a way to make that bigger? No, that's right. I think we're just going to have to make do. All right. So this is the motion. And the motion reads, so uh, now comes defendant Karen Reed by and through undersigned counsel and hereby moves this honorable court and pursuant to the 5th, 6th, and 14th amendments. Hey, where are the 5th, 6th, and 14th amendments? Do you remember? <laughs> Especially not my number. I'm just kidding. And not when I had to memorize two different constitutions. So no. For bark That's only on a flexing. When I passed the bar, all I had to remember was American law. She had a, a well, technically it is American law, but Puerto Rican and uh, the Constitution, right? They have their own Constitution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to dismiss counts one and three. Okay. So they were, you're right. It was count two that they were mm-hmm. hung up on. Yeah. Counts one and three, an acquittal um, against her on the grounds that the jury reached a unanimous decision. Problem is going to be proving that, isn't it? Um, so the ancient right to a jury trial is no more procedural formality, but rather a fundamental reservation of power to the American people. That's taken from Erlinger versus the United States. Um, that's a recent case from 2024, June 21. Yeah. Oh. Um, by requiring the executive recent. branch to prove its charge to a unanimous jury beyond a reasonable doubt, the fifth and sixth amendments seek to mitigate the risk of prosecutorial overreach. Okay. Um, prominent among these reasons, colonists, I'm not going to go through that. It follows that a jury acquittal is entitled to the utmost respect in our criminal justice system. The double jeopardy clause provides that no person shall be subject 
for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. I'm curious how they're arguing this in light of the law that we went over, which is my own legal research, honestly. Um, so the clause guarantees that the state shall not be permitted to take repeated attempts to convict the accused, thereby subjecting her to embarrassment expense or um, perhaps the most fundamental rule in the history of double jeopardy jurisprudence has been that a verdict of acquittal could not be reviewed or error or otherwise. Um, here, the very day after a mistrial was declared, undersigned counsel began receiving unsolicited communications from three of the 12 deliberating jurors, indicating in no uncertain terms that the jury had a firm 12-0 agreement that Miss Reed was not guilty of two of the three charges against her, including the charge of murder in the second degree, given the central importance that acquittals have held in our criminal justice system for over hundreds of years, the defense respectfully submits that the jury's unanimous agreement precludes reprosecution of Ms. Reed on counts one and three and man mandates dismissal of those charges. Um, I guess the question is, what does the other nine jurors have to say? Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to refute his claim just asking that question because he's not going to have a good retort. And I don't know what the procedural what the procedure would be for repolling the jury, honestly. I don't know how they legally do that. I think the, a fourth juror came forward also. On the 10th. Yes. So this was filed on the 8th. Okay. There was uh, somebody, a, a supplemental affidavit filed on the 10th. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get to that one as okay. well. Um, so to the extent the court believes further factual development is required, the defense respectfully requests that a post verdict inquiry be held on the issue and that the court authorized defense counsel to seek additional proof from the jurors regarding their having unanimously acquitted. So he's basically asking for them to be polled mm -hmm. now, after the fact. He's giving background. Uh, Miss Reed was charged on three separate counts. We know the whole story. And when the jury presented a note to the court, all counsel were ordered to the courtroom. The note was not presented to counsel for review, but they read it in open court. Um, rather, the court indicated that the jury was at an impasse. Once the jury was seated, the court then read the jury note verbatim in open court and without providing enough, any opportunity for defense counsel to be heard. The court declared a mistrial and excused the jury. I guess I'm curious about this argument. What duty does a judge have to notify counsel or allow them an opportunity to object in a trial where counsel at, especially at the end mm -hmm. knows very well that they could object at any time for literally any reason. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe me, go, go ask a uh, Daryl Brooks. <laughs> Cause he literally did that objected at any time I know. for any and every reason mm -hmm. real or imagined. What duty does a judge have to remind counsel that he has the opportunity to object? I guess would be my legal question if I were an appellate judge reviewing this case. And it's not going to be answered in this. Just no, so you know. <laughs> um, so in short, neither defense counsel nor the defendant consented to the mistrial. Um, and the court never ascertained from the jury whether its deadlock was in relation to one, two, or all of the charges in the indictment. Obviously, there's a couple of issues. One is, I think the court was aware that the defense objected to the mistrial. Mm -hmm. The last time that they, that they asked when the judge specifically asked for their input, they objected to the mistrial. Mm -hmm. So the court was aware. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess the question is whether or not that's sufficient to carry over into Monday. Yes. Uh, which would have been the declaration of a mistrial. Because I think at that hearing on Friday, they basically said that, look, I'm going to give them these new instructions and then we'll yes. come back and we'll see what we're going to do. And that give was the remedy. Time. Yeah. And then more time passed and then they were at this impasse. And so the judge said, F it. I'm done. Maybe. I feel like the, it, the mistrial ruling, I think it took the attorneys by surprise. I don't. Well, I mean, she was rather quick. To just read the note and mistrial. Like I didn't think that they were gonna there's no I thought there's no chance they're mistrialing on Monday. Mm -hmm. Remember, my prediction was they're coming back with a verdict on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. If I'm if I'm a judge on the trial of the century, what case was bigger than this Karen Reed one? Literally, where you have um the the world was watching. Mm -hmm. You have this ready made for movies situation with uh police cover ups yes. and uh 
Proctor being uh, suspended without pay for his malfeasance and calling Karen Reed a murderer the day of the mistrial being declared. And um, you have um, adulterous affairs uh, with people who are at the home that may or may not have been covering up a murder. According to the defense, uh, you have a, a dead body laying in the snow by this salt of the earth guy that was taking care of kids. Um, and, you know, by all accounts, a really good guy. Mm -hmm. Um it has all the hallmarks of a really good legal movie. Yes. And it grips the attention of the American public, the world public really, because of the accusations of law enforcement, malfeasance, corruption, and all of those things. And you're the juror or, or you're the judge in charge of all of this. Why would you declare a mistrial without going to talk independently mm -hmm. with the juror to at least figure something out? It just, you know, I'm not saying that it wasn't within her right to declare a mistrial. I'm just saying perhaps she was quick on the draw. Maybe she might want to run that one back if she, after she had a sandwich or something. Maybe she was just like, look, it's late. I want to go to lunch. I haven't eaten all day. I'm doing the, the 24 hour fast thing. We're done with this. Maybe it wasn't one of those, yeah. but I, I, I can't see why it would not have been worth an independent polling of where they're at to get gain further insight into where the divide was because I got to imagine if the judge knew that they were acquitting her on counts one and three mm -hmm. um, and the, the hangup was on count two, then she could have 100% said, okay, well, I'm not declaring a full mistrial on that. If you guys have full verdicts on those counts, then we could, mm -hmm. we could proceed on those counts and declare hung on count two. Yes. That would have been a, the the reasonable thing to do and save a lot of time for everybody <laughs> literally years of ap of appeals and and argument and and retrying this game. literally she could have saved the world a lot of time so was she was it the right move to declare a mistrial i don't think that anybody agrees with that but i just i can't imagine a world where she knows that the jury is is unanimous on one and three just needs some direction on two mm -hmm. and says, good, we'll stick with one and three. Cause even the instruction that the juror is like, look, we will accept counts one and three. If that's your verdict, you guys mm -hmm. just submit us the thing. Um, and we'll proceed with that. And you guys could just deliberate on two and figure it out. Exactly. Is there any legal questions that we could possibly bring to the attorney's mm -hmm. attention to clarify that would maybe better help. And, instructions and, and then and at that point, yeah. And then at, at that point, if it was really these moral conundrums, conundrums that they were not willing to uh, uh, compromise, then fine. Declare mistrial on count two. That's why, I, I, again, it gives me the feeling that she didn't want to be in this case because as soon as she had saw the opportunity to get out, she was like, mistrial. Like, I'm done. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do this. I don't know, man. Um, I'm. To me, the, the, the harder thing to prove, though, is whether or not that was actually the case. Because I know we're making these opinions. Oh, yeah, yeah. if that was the case, then definitely. Also, I don't know that well, I mean, we can never know what the judge actually knew yeah, right. um, on why she based that decision. I'm just saying that if it really went down the way that the defense is suggesting, then it would have been the easiest thing to just do as we suggested. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the following day on July 2nd, 2024, Attorney Jackson was contacted by a jury. Was this after the declaration of mistrial? I'm not sure neither defense counsel nor the defendant consent. Yeah, we did. So Attorney Jackson was contacted by a juror in this matter, juror A who stated that she or he wished to inform him of the true results of the jury deliberations. Mind you, I've literally seen law tubers come up. Oh no, they were eight to four in favor of acquittal mm -hmm. and they had other numbers for it. So I don't know where those numbers came from. Maybe they came off of Reddit somewhere or someplace on, I don't know, but this is attorney Jackson's accounting of it, which flies in the face of all of that. Um, according to juror a, the jury unanimously agreed that Cameron Reed is not guilty on count one, the most serious second degree murder. Juror A was emphatic that count one was off the table and all 12 of the jurors were in agreement that she was not guilty of such crime, which makes logical sense mm -hmm. knowing how the evidence played out. But how do we prove that, I guess, is the question, that that was actually the case. The jury also unanimously agreed that Karen Reed is not guilty of count three, which I guess makes sense because if she's not guilty of, of, of uh, count one, how could she have known that he was dead? Then how could she possibly leave the scene of a, of a death and all of that? 
Now, count two included those lesser included of, um, oh, do I still have the screen up? I don't want to, well, it included lesser included that I think one of them was a uh, driving while intoxicated or, or something like that. We'll, we'll go over them in a minute. I'm not sure. I yeah. don't include manslaughter. But I understand that the lesser included would, I could understand why they would be hung up mm -hmm. on that. So another day later on July 3rd, attorney Yannetti was contacted by two different individuals who had received information from two distinct jurors, jurors B and C. So we got three and mind you, there's four, as far as we know, as of today's date, uh, both of whom were part of the deliberating jury in this case. Informant B sent attorney Yannetti a screenshot that he had received from someone of text messages that intermediary B had received from jury B. And in that screenshot, jury B texted the following to intermediary. The jurors were on as a group text. Mm -hmm. Yes. So maybe that's a thing that could be proven. Um, it was not guilty on second degree and split in half for the second charge. I thought the prosecution didn't prove the case. No one thought she hit him on purpose or even thought she hit him, even thought she hit him on purpose sick. I think they meant to say on yeah. accident. Um, informant C had been in contact with another individual intermediary C who was a coworker and friend of juror C and joined a zoom meeting during the, which juror C discussed the trial informant C sent attorney Unetti the below screenshots of his or her text messages with intermediary C regarding that juror C revealed in the zoom meeting. No consideration for murder two. for murder two. man manslaughter started pulling at six, six, then ended deadlock. Four no, eight yes. Wow. There were eight to four. And so I guess that's where the eight mm -hmm. to four comes yes. from, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I guess F me. Don't I look like the <laughs> asshole? I'm over. I'm, I'm, a, I'm dunking on this YouTuber who I don't even know who it is. I just, I've heard, I literally don't remember. I heard, I, 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 I watched a video where somebody said eight to four. This must have been where it came mm -hmm. from. I apologize for whoever that was. Whoever that was. Um, interesting. If it was no consideration for, mur for murder two, shouldn't she have been acquitted on that count and hung on the remaining charges? Not necessarily. Goes back to the jury verdict slip that was all confusing. So they're saying the jury slip was confusing. Um, I don't know. The one that I saw was not that confusing. No, it and literally not. had check boxes, guilty or not guilty. What do you think? Um, and if confusion was the issue, then I think it would have been. instructions. Yeah. Okay, so she should have been acquitted. I agree. Yes, the remaining charges were that they were hung on, and that instruction paper was very confusing. Interesting. So here's their argument. Uh, the jury's unanimous conclusion that Miss Reed is not guilty on counts one and three constitutes an acquittal and precludes reprosecution. And they go back to this quoting case law uh, that we kind of already went over. What constitutes an acquittal is not to be controlled by the form of the action in question. Rather, the court must determine whether the action actually represents a resolution, correct or not, of some or all of the factual elements of each offense charge. And they, they're, they're quoting Commonwealth v. Bab. Uh, the mere presence or absence of check marks on a form is not dispositive. Here, the attached affidavits by attorneys Jackson and Yanetti reflect statements by three deliberating jurors that the jury had reached a final unanimous conclusion that Miss Reed was not guilty on counts one and three. There was nothing tentative about the jurors' statements. To the contrary, they were definitive in describing the result of the jury's deliberations. Uh, see Ellen Jackson's affidavit. Um, juror A was emphatic that count one was off the table. And that all 12 jurors were in agreement that she was not guilty on such crime. And that would be the real big one. I think, uh, what was the max on count on count one? Wasn't it life or 25? I forget. I'm mixing up cases. Um, I, I was going to say that the men, there was like a minimum of 15, but I think I'm confusing that with a different case. That can't be right. Um, David Yannetti affidavit. Uh, it was not guilty on second degree. No one thought she hit him on purpose or even thought she hit him on uh, accident. No consideration for murder too. All right. We already read that Supreme court's decision in Bluford is not to the contrary there. A juror had reported. Okay. So this is instructive. A juror had reported during deliberations that the jury was unanimous against the charges of capital murder 
and first degree murder, but split on manslaughter, the court sent the jury back to continue deliberations. And when the jury remained unable to reach a verdict declared a mistrial, the Supreme Court rejected the defendant's argument that the double jeopardy clause prohibited reprosecution for capital and first degree murder. In doing so, the court relied heavily upon the lack of finality of the juror's report. Why is he quoting that case then? I know, it's the opposite. Yeah, I'm, I hate it. This is giving me like flashbacks to law school. Like I hate like when I have like something in my head and then yeah. he starts quoting something yes. and it's like, what did he, I don't get it. Did, did I miss something? Okay. So the jur, the jur, do you ever have those dreams where it's like, oh, it's like the end of the semester and, and it's like finals week and I have this final, but I haven't been to this class the entire semester and um, I have no idea what is, uh, I still have those dreams to this day. Yes. I, I have some weird dreams about either missing an assignment not being prepared for a test because i didn't go to the class right yeah. now. i didn't know that the test was on that day um, i don't know why those dreams come i saw the other day the reminder that i had graduated from law school i think it was like <laughs> but i started i uh that when i started it was 14 years ago still i have those dreams i don't i don't know why those are the exact dreams I have. I have like a dream, like um, I went to class the first day and then it just like effed off on it and just for you know forgot about the class. Now it's finals week. It's like, holy shit, what was that class about? And then it's like I'm supposed to take the final. Anyway, okay, so the the jury's deliberations had not yet concluded, and it went back to the jury room to deliberate further. Here, by contrast, the jurors' statements reflect a final determination. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the difference is final determination that persisted through the end of deliberations. I guess the question is. Can you corroborate that by a yeah. post-judgment text message thread Unless shared on social media with non-jurors? People embellish. I know. <laughs> all the time to their friends. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just um, the, the source of the evidence is not good is all. Uh, so even assuming arguendo, which I use that, I use that word all the time or I used to, and it got on people's nerves. Yeah. <laughs> I just like the word. Even assuming arguendo and contrary to the foregoing, this court finds that, that retrial would not be prohibited under Bluford. This court can and should afford broader protection under Massachusetts state law. So they're arguing for broader protection. So there, this is almost dead on arrival, but certainly going to be going, going to appellate courts. Um, they're citing cases. All right. So their, their second point, re-prosecution is independently barred because there was no manifest necessity to declare a mistrial. The double jeopardy, the double, as we, we read, the manifest mm -hmm. yes. necessity is required. Um, double jeopardy clause affords a criminal defendant a valued right to have her trial completed by a particular tribunal. Thus, where a mistrial, hey, we literally quoted that case. Mm -hmm. Thus, where a mistrial is entered without the defendant's request or consent, retrial is impermissible unless there was a manifest necessity for the mistrial. Here, Ms. Reed did not consent to the declaration of a mistrial um, and see his affidavit. Um, absent the defendant's consent, state and federal double jeopardy protections bar as a general rule, retrial of a defendant whose initial trial ends without a conviction. That's a stretch. Mm -hmm. That is a stretch of that, that case. It doesn't mean what he's wanting it to mean. Um, the question is just simply, does double jeopardy attach procedurally if defendant was not given the opportunity to object prior to the judge declaring a mistrial? And then the question becomes, if the defense was ever afforded the opportunity to object, does it carry every single interaction with the judge going forward? Those are the questions in my mind. Um, so absent defendant's consent. Okay, so the rule is rooted in the importance of the defendant of being able once and for all. I understand. You can't be tried twice for the same thing. You can't just keep holding something over your head. That's what he's going to say. So here the defense respectfully submits the lack of opportunity to be heard alone is dispositive. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think about that argument? He's saying it's dispositive, meaning that it's automatic that, yeah. she, which is not it's, yeah, how that's going to go down. Like you said it's a little bit of a, of a stretch. <laughs> I mean, I understand why. Well, number one, 
he knows he probably knows that this motion is going to get denied. Mm -hmm. He's preserving oh, yes. it for appeal. Mm -hmm. By the way, um, as this case is in appeal, and this could be an appeal for a couple of years, um, they cannot recharge her until the uh, appellate decision is resolved. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Which leads us to the, the to uh, the very real scenario that Karen Reed might be in her 50s before they ret retry this case. Yes. And as crazy as this case was with people not, you know, butt dials and all of that, mm -hmm. uh, imagine how crazy it's going to be, you know, six years down the road when everybody's like, you know what, man, do we have to? Or, I mean, like, we have to go through this again. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the record is independently lacking on the second prong as it reflects to no careful consideration. I agree with this portion of it. So, all right, I missed something. I was going to skip things. Um, this action was sudden, brief, and unexpected, neither preceded nor accompanied by a discussion with counsel. I agree because it literally was not. We saw the video. Um, and he cites a case, Pickard v. Commonwealth, finding no manifest necessity where no... Op this is interesting. This oh. is something. Finding no manifest necessity where no opportunity was given counsel to argue the propriety of the question of the necessity of a mistrial. That is highly relevant. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now yes. we got some meat on the bone <laughs> yes. that we could chew on. So there is something there. Uh, Commonwealth v. Steward. Um, there's another case finding that no manifest necessity where trial judge first ruled that he was going to declare it a mistrial and then almost as an afterthought, unenthusiastically asked whether counsel objected that's interesting because they're citing the judge's lack of enthusiasm as a potential grounds for um lack of finding of manifest necessity which we've all seen is required in massachusetts mm -hmm. so there's that um i gotta imagine though that the judge is going to vehemently uh defend herself in that oh, to yes. that regard of course yes. And all my other questions are, apply, which I'm not going to repeat because I don't like doing that. Um, the re record is independently lacking on the second prong as it reflects no careful consideration no, or alternatives to a mistrial. Here, there was one obvious alternative to simply ask the jury to specify the charge in which it was deadlocked. I agree. Mm -hmm. The very least that could have been done. Every trial, you know what? I've never had a trial that I've litigated go to a mistrial. Okay. The one time that it was close where I thought it might go to a mistrial, my client was acquitted. Okay. And so we won. But it was a thing. It was like, look, they've been deliberating for like five days. This is probably going to be a hung jury. They called us back and was like, oh, well, shit, we won. Nice. Um, let's bust out the Dalmore 25. I didn't have that kind of money back then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Had the court done so that, and the jury articulated its verdict consistent with the statements of jurors A, B, and C, the double jeopardy implications would have been clear and decisive. I understand what he's arguing. So the Supreme Court's holding in Commonwealth v. Roth um, that courts should not request partial verdicts on lesser included offenses charged in a single count does not pertain here. Um, they're talking about other stuff. Okay, so the third, their third point is this. The defense is at least entitled to conduct a post-verdict inquiry. This is what I'm curious about. All right, so undersigned counsel did not initiate the communication with jurors A, B, and C, which resulted in the disclosure of information that is memorialized in counsel's affidavits that are appended to this motion. Should this court find that further factual development is required, the defense respectfully requests that the court conduct a voir dire of the jury and or an evidentiary hearing a bit much to substantiate the existence of an acquittal. Should the court seek the affidavit of each juror, the defendant asks for the court to authorize undersigned counsel to initiate contact for the sole purpose of asking each juror whether the jury had unanimously agreed that the defendant was not guilty of counts one and three. So he's basically prescribing a potential remedy. Uh, the, so the Supreme Judicial Court has held that because of the importance of the issue. I'm boring myself reading this. You ever get that thing in law school where it's like, okay, I'm done reading old Greek language. And then like, but I can't because it's like finals week. I have to study for the bar. And then I literally have like this ADHD energy and I would start like twirling in my chair like a helicopter. 
It's like, I want to, I want to not do this so bad, but I can't. You have to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, it is similarly a fundamental tenet of our system of justice that a defendant may not be retried for a crime of which he was. All right. I think we get what he's arguing. Conclusion. We want to, we, we want uh, double jeopardy to apply. So his affidavit was this, and I'm going to read this one and the other one. Um, I am a partner at law firm work, Worksman Jackson and Quinn. On Tuesday, July 2nd, I was contacted by Juror A based on my current conversation with Juror A and that juror's description of who or she he, she is, where he or she was seated, and certainly identifying information, name and occupation, disclosed during the voir dire process. I was able to positively identify which juror he or she was. Juror A told me that he or she was seeing in accurate reports about the splits among the jurors related to the mistrial. Where did that information come from then? Mm -hmm. Because if it came with from one of the jurors, then you got a problem, don't you? Then this motion is dead on arrival. Once we do what what Jackson requested, then that juror is going to say, no, no, no. I thought she was guilty on second degree. And then it's like, okay, well, this was a big waste of time, wasn't it? That's a big deal. Um, okay, so juror A told me she was in accurate reports. Okay, juror A stated that he or she wished to be respectful of the privacy of the deliberative process but did not wish but did wish to inform me of the true results of such process juror a indicated that he or she believes it important to disclose such results because he or she believes that those results significantly impact miss reed's rights have you ever done a jury trial and then talk to the jury afterwards not really it's um it's fascinating to do that man the jurors get hung up on such crazy things um i had one juror literally tell me that oh, i just thought that the other attorney was an asshole oh yeah and uh, you made a lot more sense and that guy was a dick i wouldn't have, I, would, I was not believing anything that he said and um, that's why he ruled in my favor because he kind of asked for feedback and stuff i mean i've seen documentaries where they interview the jurors after trial and it's interesting to say like like how they based their decisions yeah. and why they were thinking what they were thinking sometimes it's like Really? I've heard stories where um, <laughs> one juror was like, you know, I went to the restroom and I happened to run into a defense counsel there and um, I saw him use the restroom and not wash his hands. And I was like, you know what? That's disgusting. Mm -hmm. I'm not believing anything that he says. And I'm, I'm voting for guilt no matter what. Which is an extreme example, but it that's literally a thing that happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, so juror A told me that the result of the deliberations was that the jury unanimously agreed that Karen Reed is not guilty of count one. Juror A was emphatic that count one second degree murder was off the table and all 12 of the jurors were in agreement that not guilty, that she was not guilty of such crime. Juror A told me that shortly following that determination regarding count one, the jury was also unanimously agreed that Karen Reed was not guilty in count three. On July 1, 2024, when the jury presented a note to the court, all counsel were ordered to the courtroom. The note was not presented to counsel for review. Rather, the court indicated that the jury was at an impasse. It should have been, it, I don't, I've never been involved in a trial where notes from the jury was not presented to me ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And even if, because it's hard to do that when you're, because you, when you're waiting a verdict on a trial, you literally are instructed, at least in my jurisdiction, to be within 15 minutes of the court at all time. And so you're just kind of hanging out like a Starbucks. Wrong. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they say, okay, you've been summoned to the court. The jurors have a question. And then before you ever get there, they will, give you a document this is the question and then you have a chance to consider and then they hold a hearing um and then that's how they do it so it's significant because number one um you need time as a attorney to process what the juror is asking to consider whether or not we're going to object or, or or recommend certain things or request certain things but to do it and just read it in open court and then just make a decision right there is kind of out of bounds mm -hmm. it's not illegal but it just seems like you shouldn't do that. But it's not against law. I mean, I guess she was well entitled to do that. It just, you know. Um, okay, so once the jury was seated, the court then read the jury note verbatim in open court and without providing any opportunity for defense counsel to be heard, the court declared a mistrial and excused the jury. I wonder if Jackson at that point was going to object and then stopped himself knowing that he's going to make this motion just in case. Maybe. because he wanted the mistrial because mm -hmm. that was going to be like a victory of sorts but then he wanted the ability to uh, raise this issue mm -hmm. and then delay 
the filing of new charges for a number of years, highly discouraging the Commonwealth from bringing new charges in the future. I wonder if this was like just a thing that, because he knew that he, he could have objected. He's like, Your Honor, objection? There's no chance that he didn't know that. Yeah. My nervous energy would not allow me to not object. <laughs> it just wouldn't. Oh, man. All right. So neither Ms. Reed nor the counsel consented to the entry of the mistrial. Defense counsel was denied the opportunity to request that the court inquire on which counts or counts the jury may have been deadlocked. Nor did the jury, nor did the court on its own inquire of the jury for person on which counts the jury was at an impasse. Again, it's important to understand that the, the judge didn't have to do any of that. Um, had the court so inquired, it appears clear that not guilty verdicts would have been recorded for counts one and three. The prosecution would disagree because all it takes is one to disagree. And then, you know, they get to retry the case. Um, and that was the extent of his. Now let's read the other one. Let's read the other one. No, I don't want to say. Okay. Ren says, uh, bro threw an ADHD tantrum. I feel like I did that the other day when I was going on about uh, the uh, council was literally like, your honor, we don't have her BAC. He's like, your honor, I don't need her BAC. That lady was properly blitzed. There's no sane person that would ever conclude that she was not intoxicated mm -hmm. at an extreme level. Bullshit. I almost said bullshit. Almost. Um, okay. Where is uh, my notes? Um, okay, so I did that one. Here's the supplement. All right, cool. This one's on Reddit, so I don't have to do any special tricks. You know, from now on, I'm just going to take the Reddit links rather than try to be professional and download the actual PDF. And this is way easier. Okay. So screen shared. So this is a supplemental affidavit. This was filed on July 10th, a couple of days ago. Um, he says the same thing. So now he's bringing up juror D based on my conversation with juror D and that juror's description of who she was. Uh, I was able to pause. Okay. Juror D told me that he decided to reach out because he was uncomfortable with how a trial ended. He said that the last day of trial was a whirlwind. Everything happened fast. He recounted that. I'm just going to say his perspective. It could be a her. Oh, shit. I just screwed something up. How do I zoom back in on that? Damn it. No, I just got to read this. Small oh, man. All right. I'm just going to, I'm just going to roll with it. All right. So he was uncomfortable with how it ended. Uh, he said that the last day of trial was a whirlwind. Um, he recounted that. His perspective was that the jury was brought into the courtroom. The note was read. His trial was declared. And the jury was then rushed out of the courtroom following a brief meeting with the judge. The next thing they all knew, the jury was on the bus. He has described the, he described the end of the trial as very confusing. Jury said that it was very troubling that the entire case ended without the juror being, jury being asked about each count, especially counts one and three. Jury D explained that the jury reached not guilty on counts one and three, and the disagreement was solely on count two. Jury D said that the jury was actually disgusting, telling the judge that they had agreed unanimously, unanimously on guilty verdicts or not guilty verdicts for counts one and three, but they were not sure if they were allowed to say so. That is infuriating. If that's true, it's infuriating. And again, all it takes is one. And then it's no longer a thing. Um, juror D said that the, okay, the jury believed that they were compelled to come to a resolution on all counts before, which is really important because they need to know that they didn't have to agree on yeah. every single count to avoid a mistrial. Now, it kind of makes sense what, I don't know, I don't remember who it was that mentioned that they were confused about the forms, but I remember that you mentioned they were uh, confused about the instructions on the form. So maybe the instructions didn't include the option of finding, uh, I kept putting her from on That's some and, and not on uh, another one. I don't know if you've ever had to do this before, but when I was working for the DA's office, um, as like a, basically a paralegal, cause I was still in law school, I was interning at the DA's office. Mm -hmm. 
one of my big jobs was I had to like write jury instructions. Mm -hmm. And it was like, this is confusing as F <laughs> to me. Like, how are, are they going to try to, how are they going to figure this out? Mm -hmm. And again, I was like a second year law student. So I wasn't, not, I, was, I was basically a lawyer in utero. Um, it was wild. They actually had me arguing cases. Did you ever get to do that? Like when you're in law school, not even an attorney, but you're supervised oh, yeah. by the attorney, like arguing motions. Yeah. That was really scary. Yeah, Nowadays, it it's just like, uh, <laughs> you know, I could do it in my sleep. But back then it was like, Calling my mom, mom, I'm about to argue the big case. It was like literally like a bail, a bail mm -hmm. hearing. Something super simple. <laughs> okay, so um, once the case is over, she remained very okay. Explain after the jury was excused and aboard the bus, many of the jurors appeared uncomfortable with how things ended, wondering, is anyone going to know that we acquitted Karen on counts one and three? No one ever asked about those counts. Juror D stated that once the case was over. She reigned very uncomfortable with the results. She reiterated it did not feel right. She said that part of her discomfort was that she knew that the jury had reached verdicts on two counts. That's a big deal, man. That's a huge deal. And then it begs the question, how much instruction did the jury actually receive if those were their questions? Every jury trial I've ever been a part of, the judge has gone out of their way to make the jury feel comfortable mm -hmm. and not confused and all of these things. I don't know, man. Um, it's infuriating on those, on, on those grounds, but it's infuriating because it's so legally difficult to do what Jackson is asking. Even if, you know, he's right. Um, it's not that difficult for the appellate court to say, yeah, well, whatever. They could retry her anyway. What's mm -hmm. the harm? And honestly, they're going to, they're, they're probably just going to fall back on that. That's the easiest thing to do. That's infuriating. Um, so I inquired, I inquired whether her opinion, other jurors would agree and acknowledge that not guilty verdicts were reached on counts one and three. Juror D, without hesitation, said in substance, every one of us will agree and acknowledge that we found Karen not guilty of counts one and three because that's what happened. Okay. All it takes is one, right? So I wonder if all 12 jurors were to come and like write affidavits like, yeah, informal poll here, but I would have said not guilty on one and three. Mm -hmm. Then I think that it's an easier case. What's the likelihood of that happening? Happening though. Slim to none. Um, Juror D reiterated that she believes that it would be unjust for Karen Reed to be retried on either count one or count three because the jury already unanimously found her not guilty of those charges. Juror D further stated that if necessary, she would agree to testify in order to explain to the court that the juror, una jury unanimously reached not guilty verdicts. Okay. My question then just is simply without representation from all 12 jurors, how do we get there? Mm -hmm. What if somebody just wants to F off to the mountains because they're sick of it all and they don't even know any of this is happening. And because we can't get their um, opinions, we cannot proceed any further. So them are the stakes, man. Them are the stakes. Uh, hey, what was that noise? Dominic, was, did I miss something? Okay. It was like a little shine. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's where we're at with the Karen Reed mistrial. Where do we go from here? Um, I actually don't know um, what's, I mean, obviously they're going to have to make a ruling on the motions. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes to either corroborate Jackson's affidavit or Yanetti's affidavit. He wrote one too. I'm not going to read it because we're already an hour and a half in, hour 45 minutes in. Um, there's not really a clear cut legal no. procedure or requirement for the jurors to be making themselves available without, I guess, a subpoena. Is the subpoena even legal under these circumstances? I'm not sure in Massachusetts. I'm not sure. It's going to be difficult. There's a lot of things. It's readily apparent to me that there's a lot of things that could have happened that didn't happen. And um, should a mistrial have been declared? I obviously thought, no. Um, it makes all the sense in the world that this judge would have just pulled the juror. All right, what are we deadlocked on? What's the issue? You guys have had a weekend. And they were only deliberating for like an hour before she just declared, you know what? I think we're just going to be done. I'm not going to make you guys compromise on your morals. 
Um, she took the the juror's note at face value and made certain decisions um, that is going to create probably three to four years of additional litigation for no reason. When she could have just asked the jurors, hey, what do you think on counts one and three? And then if, if the acquittals run one and three, is the, is, is the Commonwealth really going to be pursuing her strictly on the basis of count two? I don't know. Maybe they would have. Maybe they would have. Uh, but then were the stakes. Um, and that's all we have, really, for uh, for that. Um, final thoughts on the Karen Reed situation right now, Ileana. What, what do you think? I just really want to know what the decision is going to be. Other than that, we're kind of stuck. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of time. Yeah, I think Ileana needs a sandwich. So I think here's what we're going to do. We're gonna we're going to uh, we're gonna wrap up uh, this live, and we're going to go to the other live, Family Law After Dark. If y'all haven't, uh, hey Dominic, is the Patreon have the link to the thing? Uh, okay. You guys, we're gonna get you the Family Law After Dark link right now. Um, if you're a Patreon describe subscriber, uh, Dominic's going to be posting that. Uh, for our subscribers now if you're not subscribed to the patreon uh, because of whatever number one uh, dominic really needs uh, to make money so yeah. he um, would really appreciate it if y'all would go down there and we'll call it the dominic fund go subscribe to a uh, the at, at least the the lowest form of the the patreon um, membership what do you get with that you get all kinds of exclusive content, our movie reviews that are going to be started. You get to see Rengeri get dunked on in our first and initial tilted court. She tried to argue in favor of Laura Owens. Oh, okay. And um, her argument was that uh, what was happening to Laura amounted to cyber bullying. And in, in which case um, she got sufficiently dunked on when I argued the opposite way. Um, but full credit to, to Rengeri because she did an, uh, an amazing job being a prospective law student um, and stepping into that arena. She was kind of outgunned, um, but she made a valiant effort and she's going to try it again at some point really soon. <laughs> Ren says uh, monetizing on my dunking is heavy. <laughs> it, it is heavy, Rengeri, but um, she was... Okay, Dominic is setting up the link right now to the Family Law After Dark. So, folks, when we sign off here, um, go to the Patreon, um, get that link, and then we're going to resume with Family Law After Dark. For those paid members that want to participate in the Patreon, uh, let me know or let Dominic know or drop a line in the Discord, and we'll get you a link, and then you guys could chime in. Um, and that would be, uh, well, that would be a thing, wouldn't it? Um, is everything set up with the yeah, all right folks I love you lots and um, by the way next week um, there was an uh, you know what just for shits and giggles um, we had a comment on our Micah Miller coverage you remember her yes the AI, the AI girl not the AI girl but the, the AI call and all um, so there was this comment that uh, well it didn't piss me off it just amused me um, but I was already planning on us revisiting the Michael Miller case mm -hmm. to see the new developments in that because I wanted to see if there's more information that came out that would corroborate whether or not this was an AI call or whether or not there was something more nefarious going on with the Michael Miller case or if it really was just a suicide. Mm -hmm. There's been developments. We're going to be covering that next week. Um, but in the meantime, Dominic had clipped up one of our, our show from like May 18th or whenever it was. And this one comment came through and I wanted to read it. Uh, because it was amusing. Ooh. Scare me. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so this was the comment. It comes from, um, you know what? I'm going to share my screen with you folks because I'm already here. Why not? Um, here it is. All right. So there was this comment by Lulu Loveberry 4161. And she says this. So my question continues to be, why cover these cases when you're not willing to do use your critical thinking skills or your research skills to inform your subscribers? Hey, Eliana, you don't really read the comments, huh? I don't. So you don't get, you don't get to see all of this uh, this stuff? I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, she says, um, we're not willing to use our critical thinking skills or our research skills to inform our subscribers. What I don't think that Lulu Berry realized is that mm -hmm. this was from a clip from like two months ago mm -hmm. and that we were like going off of available information at the yes, time and all of these conspiracy theories that have developed were not really a thing yet. And so she's like uh, trying to dunk on us mm -hmm. for not doing our research. But this is what she said. She says, I unsubbed a long time ago, but she just watched this video and commented on our latest drop. So oh. there's that. Um, because it always hurts me to hear smart people say dumb things. If you had done your research, you would have found that Micah used the phrase kill myself once before in a recorded video during a trip to Africa. You know why I didn't know that? Because that wasn't a thing back on May 18th when we were researching the case. We just took the, the stuff that was from law enforcement that they had released. Um, True Grizzly Crimes, who is basically the authority um, of uh, Internet sleuthing that I'm aware of, she's the best out there, mm -hmm. um, was not privy to all of this. And so all of this was very new. So she says, the reason this matters is because if you watch and listen to that recording, you'll see Micah use her deep Southern drawl. So her natural unconscious authentic speech pattern is to pronounce this phrase as kill myself. The, the AI generated recording that fooled, that fooled you. We've been fooled, Eliana. Yeah, okay. You are uncritical. You are uncritical mind. Okay, you can't say you can't you can't try to dunk on me and then write like that for one. Yes. <laughs> Come on, man. I mean, I feel like she's probably three or four whiskey double neats mm -hmm. in at this point, but you can't write this way and then try to dunk on me for being uncritical. Is all I'm saying. Um, so her natural uncon okay, the I generated courting that fooled you are uncritical mind. It's literally what she wrote. All right. Has her pronounced this phrase as Northeasterner would. Now, using the login you were supposed to learn in law school, I have no idea what she's talking about. What? Tell me who puts on a fake accent to call 911 to alert them of their impending unaliving. I have to really digest that question to even know what she's really asking. Mm -hmm. I don't, I honestly don't know what she's asking. That 911 was, has her assuming that this, I assume that this is a she because there's a dress, mm -hmm. a cartoon of a dress. That 911 has her using an accent that is not her unforced speech pattern. You know what would have been really good if you and I had known what Micah Miller's speech pattern was beforehand mm -hmm. to maybe offer those thoughts yeah. on that video when we did it? Yes, maybe. But you know why we didn't? Because it was just a thing, mm -hmm. just dropped at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, but hey, she says accents are not the type of things one switches to and from according to one's move. And you know what's sad? Um, I, I would really disagree with that. I would also disagree with that. I can change, at least in Spanish, I can change my accent very quickly and I do it automatically when I'm speaking to clients and when I'm speaking to my family. And sometimes people don't know where I'm from because they can't tell. You know what else happens? Mm -hmm. When I um get um well there's when i get really emotionally excited mm -hmm. anger happiness comedy whatever mm -hmm. people start they say that i start to talk with like a southern draw myself really i don't know people mm -hmm. say that and it obviously changes shifts with my mood mm -hmm. and so there is that but um i'm going with her theory mm -hmm. so the 911 recording might as well had micah using a puerto rican accent does she sound puerto rican to you what no. This person I'm convinced was on a drunken rant when she left this. No. Or a British accent during a deeply traumatic event. Conversely, imagine someone with a Puerto Rican accent calling 911 to announce they are unaliving themselves in a Russian or an Argentine accent. What is she on about, man? Um, well, a lot of our a, a lot of our followers, um, including Lethal Lauren. You know Lauren Knighty? Lauren's awesome. She's um I've done um, I've done live streams with her. Mm -hmm. uh, she has her own YouTube channel. Um, she's really, really good. She's like 31 years old. I think that she works as like a psychologist. Uh, but she wrote to this person, hey, I got something for you. This link may be very helpful. Mm -hmm. It's a list of productive ways to fill out your time. And then it's like you could read. <laughs> you could watch a movie. Yeah. You could meditate. <laughs> you could, uh, you know, all these different things. 
Um, I had responded to this lady's like, you know, for all your critical thought that you put into this post, you fail to realize that this was a clip from a show produced not long after the incident occurred. And before all of the theories that you just outlined had been developed, you further failed to realize that I had been planning a future live stream addressing these theories. I'm pretty sure I talked about that or not. I don't know. I don't know. Um, as a, as a, Oh, I cut my own self off. How do I even get into the rest of it? I don't know. I said something. I said something. Um, Ooh. Once again, my only point is, I, I think the, hey, whoever that was, she used to be a subscriber. She's no longer a subscriber. She really liked her Christopher Watts mock cross-examination that I really needed you for because I wanted you to be the judge because I was forced to make my own objections and rule on my own objections. And you've already uh, known. I know how that goes. Seen how that's going to go. Objection. Overruled. Oh. But you're the judge. Bullshit. I'm doing it anyway. That's <laughs> how it is. All right. And I might have to add the Puerto Rican and the Argentinian accent in English is probably going to be the same. Your Argentine accent? No. I mean, in Spanish, you can tell the difference between Argentine, Argentinian and Puerto Rican accent, but those I would not be able English, to tell the difference between those two. Things. The same because Spanish. Micah Miller's not even Puerto Rican or. I know. I don't know. I, I think she was just talking shit. Um, here's my here's my note to her. It was just like, look, you know, I I have one rule, and this, you know, I really do just have one rule. Yeah. In our community, which is growing, and awesome, our people are amazing. Um, we got prospective law students in our group. We got retired mm -hmm. folks. We got. Um, people that are living their lives and, you know, dealing with their personal issues, but everybody in our community is very respectful of everybody else. My only rule is this. Don't be a dick. Mm -hmm. That's all. Just don't be an asshole. Like it's the easiest thing to do. I said, I haven't looked at this case in two months rather than saying, well, did you consider all these other things? Which I haven't because back in mid-May, they were not a thing. Inviting discussion, exchange of ideas. You wanted to try demonstrating how much smarter you were than everybody else from way over there. Oh, she there was an there she was getting an argument with some of her other commenters and oh, she's okay. like, I didn't mean anything by it. She said she said, I, I said that he was smart. It's like, you know, I've been smart for a long time and I don't really need that validation, but thanks for the compliment and all. But you knew what you were doing. You knew you were being yeah. a dick. I didn't, you know, just be nice. That's all. Just come up, have a drink. Mm -hmm. We can all hug it out. We're still friends. Which is kind of how I treat everybody, man. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, you could disagree with me. You could think that I'm being uncritical. You could think that I'm a uh, You can agree to disagree. Yeah, it, it that's that's all fair game. Um, oh, that was the Discord chime, wasn't it? That's the chime that I'm hearing. I'm just saying, just be nice. That's all. All right, folks, I got to wrap this up. We've been going for a couple of hours now. Let's do the uh, let's do Family Law After Dark, folks. Go on to the Patreon. Um, if you don't have the link to the Patreon, what's the, what's the link to the Patreon, Dominic? I put it in chat, but I put it in the Discord as well. Okay. Um, Dominic has linked it in the chat and he's linking it in the discord as well. Um, go to the Patreon, click on the link. It's unlisted on the YouTube page. It's strictly for the Patreon subscribers. Uh, we will see you guys next week. We're going to be covering more of some Micah Miller, uh, for the rest of you in about five minutes, we're going to be doing some, uh, family law after dark or so. I got to feed Ileana. Uh, love you all. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>